It's good to start with a picture of something uplifting, but it's not always appropriate. I'm starting my talk with this tired old picture of an incident on the Waterford Greenway when it was still a railway. The picture was taken almost 100 years ago, and it's not quite what it seems. For a start, nobody lost their life in this particular incident. The viaduct was already broken and unusable when a train was sent off the edge. The broken locomotive was recovered and scrapped, and the viaduct was rebuilt. And the general vicinity, I'm glad to say, is a lot tidier and safer today. I'd show you a photograph from the same position, but there's rather a lot of woodland in the valley now, and all you'd see is trees. Now, speaking of woodland, I have a confession to make and I will not beat about the bush. There is no guidebook to the archaeology along the Waterford Greenway. When I was approached to give this talk, I honestly thought there would be. I had one in mind and it only needed a few spare weeks to get itself realised. But the day job went mental this summer. I've not been so busy since the Celtic Tiger, and I just haven't found time to do the guidebook, I'm afraid. The guidebook isn't just wishful thinking. I've done similar things in the past. It started many years ago in a faraway galaxy called Scotland, um, where I put together a booklet to sell on, a, on, the, on site at an excavation in the Inner Hebrides. This was in 1986, a long time ago. Not a particularly popular spot, I must say. It was A5 landscape, the little booklet, properly printed in black and white. Um, as I was saying, there weren't a lot of visitors to run. That was the island. Um, but there were plenty a few years ago later at a place called Whithorn, not far from the ferry point at Stranra. Now, the Whithorn dig. This was an excavation which ran on for years in the late 1980s and early 1990s. I'd wanted to do something like this guidebook for years and I'd sort of dabbled with that earlier one there. Um, and I was given the chance to indulge myself and to reindulge with another book because the first one went out of date and conveniently sold out at about the same time. So a second one came online. That was hard work. Everything in those days was physically pasted onto large sheets of paper with blue lines separating the different pages in a particular order, half of them upside down. Lots of real cutting and pasting with a scalpel and glue. Um, at least it was all the right way round because in earlier days, of course, these books had pages made up of type and plates in reverse running back to front. Making guidebooks has definitely got a lot easier. And in the 21st century, when digging work was scarce, I turned my attention to a booklet about the digs in Dungarvan County, Waterford. I'm calling it a booklet because it's quite small. 44 pages, excluding the cover. It's small enough to be manageable. There were no more large sheets of paper now. This was entirely put together on my PC and presented to the printer on disk. Two years later, I brought out another booklet on the excavations at Waterford City. I had every intention of doing more and I had Cashel County Tip lined up as the next target with its very popular Rock of Cashel. Um, but, 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 but I was barely started when I was sidetracked back to digging holes. The economy was recovering from the crash and the archaeological profession was crawling back into the ground. Anyway, the books were not selling like hot cakes. The cupboard in the office was packed with boxes of unsold literature and I needed to make a living. I always intended to get back to the booklets, but when the Waterford Greenway opened up a few years ago, I thought there might be a market for some kind of archaeological guide. And I set my mind to it in available moments. First, I decided to stick with square pages and lots of coloured ink. 
especially on the cover. This was to discourage pirate copies printed at home in these days of electronic media and mass communication, where nearly everything becomes available to download for free at some stage. I wanted to make home printing awkward. The square pages don't look great on A4 paper, and the cover is particularly annoying with a load of coloured ink bleeding off the edges. I won't be able to stop people viewing the pages on their phone, but I could at least discourage printed copies. A modest price for the original would also discourage copies. The printing costs of something like this, 44 pages and cover, are not steep, provided you have a wardrobe full at a time. If you add a few pages of adverts, the cost will come down further, but I won't take adverts, not on this, because I don't want the souvenir program look. If you're lucky, you might find a sponsor for the printing. For the Dungarvan booklet, the County Council and the Heritage Council stepped in and covered the printing cost, which was great. And they would have paid for the printing cost of the booklet if I postponed it to the following year. As I said, though, the printing costs are not very steep compared with the rest. The main cost for something like this is time. Um, the research, general design and text for a 44 page booklet can, can be done quite quickly in two weeks, but the illustrations and finishing touches take me around eight weeks. That's 10 weeks altogether, which is a long break from the day job. I haven't found a third party yet who will meet this sort of cost. So where am I now with the guidebook? I'm about a week in, this is the, Water for, the, the Greenway guidebook. I've got the general design and a good idea a good deal of the research done, but the text is not finished. The design for this one is going to be a bit different from the Dungarvan and Waterford guides. Those had an introduction, something about origins, and then more detail on different parts of the town in a roughly chronological order. Now, the picture in front of you there is the main picture, if you like, from the Waterford book. It's a, it's a main image of the town or the city in the 17th century at the end of the medieval period. It's an oblique aerial reconstruction, if you like, at the end of the medieval period. It appears on the cover, not with, the, not with bits highlighted like that. It appears on the cover and throughout the book. Where it, where it turns up in the book, it tends to have things highlighted, things picked out. Um, occasionally, it's enlarged, there are enlarged details. And as far as possible, in the Waterford book and in the Dungarvan one, the views for photographs, for any reconstructions, for any cutaways, are all aligned with this main central image, more or less facing north. This reconstruction of Reginald's Tower that I'm about to show, Reginald's Tower here on the big picture is over on the far right there. It's sticking out the corner of Waterford. It's right on a corner of the big triangular city there. This reconstruction sketch of Reginald's Tower from the, from the book has moved around slightly, but only slightly, so it's still recognisable. You've still got that basic shape of the tower and the artillery fort built in at the foot of it there. Um, and moving on past that one, because uh, because I want to go past that one. In this particular um, oblique aerial sketch here, this is has got the cathedral, one of the friaries and Reginald's Tower, Reginald's Tower out on the point there. I've just moved a little away from that general direction in the main view. This is the Viking Triangle here. This is the oldest bit of the city with Reginald's Tower at the point where the two rivers join. Reginald, who was named, uh, who was, who was the, uh, the Viking King of York, um, had the tower named after him. But in fact, it's not really his tower at all. Looking at the topography, the streets and alleyways of Waterford, it seems pretty likely that the tower as we see it, as we have it, as it is, 
was actually in the river in Reginald's day and that we've got a load of made up ground down around the tower there, including the footprint of the or a lot of the friary next door being made up ground in the 13th century reclaimed then. Now for Dungarvan, I had a general view of the town which just about matched the angle that I'd been using for reconstructions of the castle, which I'd done some work on in the late 1990s. I had north more or less to the top of the page, um, and this should have meshed quite well with original maps and plans. But when you actually go looking for the maps and plans, you find an extraordinary number of old maps and recent plans do not have north to the top. So some essential maps. This is one of the pages in the Dungarvan booklet there. And this is an 18th century map there superimposed on it. So some maps have to be kind of swiveled to come along in line. I can't overemphasize, I'll just go back there, I shouldn't be there yet. I can't overemphasize the need to watch the alignment of plans and photographs. We've probably all sat through talks about holes in the ground where the speaker has taken us on a mystery tour with pictures from all directions. Confusion is not the presenter's friend and it's not the author's friend. It's not a bad idea, I find to think about the report and the presentation as you actually start to dig, as you move the first sod and as you take your first photo. There will be times when you find yourself in an obscure corner of your site facing south because a section had to be cut in a particular way. But there are steps you can take, like a string of additional photographs and an additional photograph or two from the appropriate normal direction, which you can use to prime the audience for the disorientation you're going to draw them through in your presentation. And with digital photography, pictures are cheap. Now, over the years, I've come up with a trick or two for plans and sections too, using shadows to suggest direction but I've had some sticky moments trying to get this gimmick past some of my colleagues and I shall come back to this shortly. So, my guide for the Greenway. How was it going to work without this kind of repeated view which I could use at one end of it and at the other, at Dungarvan and at Waterford? Um, the Greenway is a former railway line between Dungarvan and Waterford southwest to northeast or vice versa um the path is surfaced all the way with signage about how far to the next town or village and where the next toilets are and gates for safe crossings on the minor roads this is actually the greenway that's got the little gate on it there a pair of gates that you kind of zigzag your way through on your bike or if you're walking and the minor road is the thing that it's more or less giving um, it's, it's got a yield sign up beside it there. So it surfaced all the way. Um, the start of it in Dungarvan is not at the uh, former railway station, Dungarvan railway station, that's gone. It's been a council depot for decades now. So it's not at the station. It's in a attractive spot where the railway line crosses the road just coming into town from Waterford. And in fact, right at the start there from that point, you get a great view of the town, which would be looking right from here across the river onto the, the front of the town that fronts the river. Um, it's, it's a nice spot, but this is probably the picture, the view you would have seen. It's the iconic view of the Greenway. It's looking back towards Dungarvan. It turns up in the brochures and things. It's looking back towards Dungarvan as the path, as the path, as the path is about to leave the coast and run inland into the Ballyvoyle Gorge. For my booklet, I took my inspiration from Alfred Wainwright, 
who made walking guides to the English Lake District and a companion to the Pennine Way, a long distance footpath back in the 1960s. This companion to the Pennine Way had the route traced from OS maps, traced in his own hand in the middle of the page and pictures and blocks of text, handwritten and hand drawn, all in just black ink in the spaces to each side. Wainwright's Pennine Way book went south to north, front to back, but could be used backwards for those walking north to south. I decided the Greenway Guide would also go south to north, Dungarvan to Waterford and left to right, which is quite convenient. And to make things easy, I would adapt something from the Dungarvan and Waterford booklets to cover the two ends, so I already had a head start on the job. Instead of traced maps, I would have oblique aerial views and we could probably do with this blown up. I'm not sure. Yes, great. Uh, oblique aerial views, more or less looking north. This is the Ballyvoyle Gorge um, and tunnel and viaduct where the train took a tumble. Now the uh, the Greenway is coming in from Dungarvan from the left there. It's coming in from where the Black Arrow is there. It snakes its way up the page and disappears off right to the top there. And on its way along here, it's going along the, uh, along the gorge, the Ballyvoyle Gorge, over the viaduct that had the problems and on through the Ballyvoyle Tunnel. It's a remarkably nice stretch of the Greenway, this. Uh, I went off to search for content to fill the pages between Dungarvan and Waterford and I was happy to do a series of disjointed snippets on spots of interest along the way, like Wainwright, but the RMP, Record of Monuments and Places, or Sites and Monuments Record, basically they're the same, it had a lot of blank areas and there's only so much you can do with another enclosure not visible at ground level or another full of fear. I didn't want to bring in the history of stately homes and their illustrious mm -hmm. owners but there is some quite interesting recent archaeology, some industrial mills and of course the railway itself. There's no record of monuments or treasure coming to light when they built the railway except for a heap of bones at a place called Woodstown, which I'll mention again. Not the heap of bones, but Woodstown. And what I needed was a string of convenient archaeological excavations in the very near vicinity. And as luck would have it, I found not one, but two. On the N25, did that come up? Oh, wrong one. There I am. I've got too many buttons in front of me. I keep pressing the wrong ones. And as luck would have it, I found not one but two on the N25, which runs between Dungarvan and Waterford. Well, of course, it's not surprising that the railway between Dungarvan and Waterford more or less shadows the main road. They were both going between the same places. There's probably a book on the development of the highway between Dungarvan and Waterford from early days in the open landscape where the tracks meandered along small watersheds, finding the driest paths, to the enclosed landscape of the 17th or 18th century, to straightening the kinks and putting down road stone, then cutting out the steep climbs to get the mail coaches through, then cutting the sharp corners to get a bit of speed, and finally putting in the bypasses. Well, the 19th century railway was designed to avoid steep climbs and sharp corners. So that was doing a lot of what the road became, which makes it surprising, the railway, that it went the pretty way through the Ballyvoyle Gorge and through the tunnel. Apparently, the opposition to the sensible route was too strong and they had to take the railway this way in the 19th century. Well, the Kilmac Thomas bypass on the N25 was built in 2000. And as that's it in the middle there, the, the green stretch, it's either green or blue in the middle there. It was built around 2000 and a string of sites were dug by John Tierney and Octra. 
This was right beside the middle stretch of the Greenway. And further along a bit more recently, but still a while back, ACS dug a string of sites under the N25 Waterford bypass, up by Waterford, the squiggly line up there, the green squiggly line. These were road schemes and both have been published, which is very useful. The Waterford bypass rediscovered the Viking site at Woodstown, a very large settlement. Woodstown, there it is, and it's in that green bit right beside the river. I'm not sure whether the river really shows up on the map, but it shows up in the picture here. Here we're looking along the Greenway, if you like, that's the Greenway on the left, right beside the river. And on the right in the picture, you can see the kind of scratch marks across the fields. Those are the backfield test trenches across the Woodstown site. Um, well, uh, Yes, the Woodstown, Woodstown site turned up on the Waterford Bypass. It was a very large settlement, probably the prototype for the Viking Triangle in Waterford. It had a remarkably long riverside with 400 metres of boat parking space, which is quite extraordinary. And the Greenway ran right along the riverside of it. Unfortunately, the Greenway presents a much clearer view of the river on the left than it does of the fields and the site of the Long Fort on the right. Um, there's still a railway, as you can see, there is still a railway going past, going past Woodstown there. Part of the Waterford Greenway is running along beside the railway rather than straight on top of it. That's because there is a small railway actually running along the line. It was there. It was there after the main railway stopped and uh, it was, it's still there now that the Greenway has been put in. I think it's called the Waterford and Shore Valley Railway. Anyway, remarkably good with, uh, with fine views of the river. But unfortunately, as I've said, you can't see a great deal over on the right there on the inland side. Um, and the same thing goes when you go a bit further upstream up the river and you pass by Kilotteran, which is the site of a very interesting early water mill. But again, the same problem. You can see the river fine on one side. You can't really see the site of the early mill on the other over to the right there. Um, now, a chronological guide there was something chronological about the Dungarvan and Waterford guides. The chronological guidebook was not really going to work on the Greenway. The, the places of interest were not arranged conveniently in any chronological order along the road, along the path. So I earmarked a few pages for a brief chronology and decided to make an eclectic choice of sites to fill the other pages. Something for everyone in the audience, really. The idea was to have 10 stops along the way, 10 places to stop. I think I might actually call it 10 stops on the way. There's a lot of traffic on a good day and I didn't want anyone to be distracted by the guidebook whilst hurtling along at several kilometers per hour in top gear on the greenway. There are vulnerable pedestrians out there too. I wanted the cyclists to actually stop for a moment. So I picked 10 spots arranged along the route all with something of interest to somebody and uh, that's about it at the moment I'm afraid. I have some blocks of text to write and a load of pictures to draw so I'm sorry that I haven't actually got any more of it done. For the drawings this is one of the few drawings that I've actually done it's one of it's that aerial view of the Ballyvoil Gorge. For the drawings I start with a with um, an image, a pen drawing on permatrace, which is something of a dying tradition as both pens and permatrace are becoming harder to find. 
These drawings and the pen I use, incidentally, it's a 0.25 nib if anybody's interested. I, I've just stuck with a 2.5 nib for decades now. I don't use the others at all. I use one drawing nib. The drawings are scanned at 600 dpi just on the uh, scanner at home and the black line on the scanned image is changed to something paler. Either grey or purple or blue will do. I find the blue line works particularly well for aerial views from high altitude. Grey is good generally for all oblique sketches and for published site plans and sections because if you superimpose captions in black, the writing tends to be quite legible, over grey that is, but over black it isn't. The line drawing is then coloured. Um, it's coloured on the PC using a small palette of Pantone colours. I have a little paper booklet of Pantone colours that I've had for years, so I use that to just check my colours to see what they're going to look like when they're printed, because I've never, I've never had my screen checked on the PC to see if it's given me the right colours. Anyway, the Pantone colours I use look almost identical in the, in the brochure, if you like, until you put them together and you find they are subtly different. And uh, then I uh, often add shadows with a semi-transparent layer of blue for a bit of depth. Now the blue might sound cold, adding blue into shadows, but it actually suggests a blue sky overhead, reflected, and so it generally cheers up the scene. For a low alt altitude view, I do like to include a figure or two as well for an impression of scale. But for something from this height, really, there's no point in trying. Or if, you, if I put in anything, it'll just be a very, very small squiggle. And then, as I said, you can add the captions and they should be legible as black over grey. I don't know whether they are legible. I'm looking at this as a, as a fairly small image in front of me. All of this works pretty well for formal pictures too. This is formal pictures for reports and publication, not guidebooks, for plans and sections. Although shadows can be controversial, as I think I mentioned before. I had all the drawings for the monograph on Barry's Court Castle down in County Cork. I had them all ready with shadows, and then I was asked to remove them as they didn't really look right. The monograph came out in 2017, but most of the drawings had actually been ready 10 years before in glorious grey half tones. Now, black and white drawings were still normal in 2007. Um, this was a while ago. And I felt that I was actually way ahead of the pack with my greys. But I'm so glad that with the delay of getting the thing published, National Monuments actually allowed me to produce the same drawings in colour for the final publication. However, I must say I'm a little disappointed that my cheery blue shadows had to go. They insisted on that, but it was easily done as the shadows were actually on a separate layer in each drawing. Um, so what was wrong with them? I was told they just didn't look right, and I think I know why. They didn't look right because there is a convention in archaeology whereby light comes from the top left of a page, which is fine when you're putting shading on the piece of metalwork or something like that, but it's really rather awkward when you extend it to plans. If you look at the old OS Ordnance Survey plans, the 25 inch, 50 inch series from the 19th and early 20th century, you'll see a thickening of the outline below and to the right of buildings, implying a shadow from a light at the top left of the map. Well, the sun never shines from this direction on our side of the equator, if north is up the page, but this didn't deter the OS. Now, of course, we're enjoying the age of Google Earth and digital globe and ubiquitous aerial and satellite photography and a generation have got used to shadows from a sudden direction. So I'm afraid I've broken with age old tradition and I've gone with a Google generation. When I use shadows on a plan or section, the sun is shining from the south or southeast or southwest, but not the mysterious northwest. And to some, the drawings just don't look right. However, 
I have found that if you include a figure with an appropriate shadow, the brain has a good chance of making the necessary adjustment. This picture here is, uh, is a plan, it's a plan out of a report, of a 17th century military toilet which emerged around a blowhole at Charles Fort, Kinsale, a few years ago. Well, I normally put my shadows in, you can see the shadows there, at 20% opacity, by which I mean the entire layer of shadows is at 20% opacity. So I can draw away overlying, overlaying bits of shadow without darkening that overlap, if you see what I mean. This is a, a complete layer of shadows, which I can put on and then take off if I don't like them. And there's no measuring involved, it's just drawing by eye so that the shadow length gives a very approximate idea of vertical height. But, but it's, it's not measurable. Um, and if you see the little figure up there, up towards the top there holding his drawing board or something, um, the shadow there is going the same way as the rest, and that's supposed to be there to make your brain think, ah, oh, well, that's how big a person is, and that's where the sun's coming from, to get the, the shadows understood. Well, the drawings can get quite complicated with a number of layers, some semi-transparent -trans and things, but at any stage I can convert everything into another format, into a ping um, or something else, and import them into Word documents or PowerPoint slides. And for the booklets, there's a stage towards the end where I actually take the black and white captions off a page, just take them off as a separate layer, and then I flatten or rasterize everything else. I love that expression, I rasterize it. I rasterize all the colored uh, artwork and photos, and then I reunite the black to present just two layers to the printer for real sharpness. Well, the drawings do take a long time, but the green way isn't going anywhere. Well, yes it is, but it isn't going to disappear in the near future. And sometime soon where I can find the time I will finish the booklet, or who knows, maybe someone will beat me to it. And that's it. Thank you very much. And it says your battery is running low on my replacement screen in front of me. Thank you very much. Bye.